Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby, uh, Chapter 4, Negative Psychoanalysis and Marxism. A beggar dreamt of a millionaire. As he awoke, he met a psychoanalyst. The latter explained to him the millionaire was a symbol for his father. Curious, remarked the beggar. Uh, this is a quote from Heinrich Regius. And it says Max Horkheimer in brackets from 1934. <clears throat> if subjectivism is the ill of conformist to psychology, an anti-subjective objectivity has cursed Marxism. The categories of the individual, psyche, subjectivity, have been cast off as immaterial, figuratively and literally, to the material and objective analysis of society. In recent years, Marxists and neo-Marxists have sought to rectify this. Yet the very terms of this correction, Marx and Freud, historical materialism and psychoanalysis, sociology and psychology, have exuded a positivistic and mechanistic approach. This manner of posing the problem suggests that the task is to make agreeable the incompatible by a round table discussion that tables the contradictions. A harmonious synthesis of Marxism in psychoanalysis presupposes that society is without the antagonisms that are its essence. True pluralism, wrote Max Horkheimer, belongs to the concept of a future society. This one is rent and torn, fractured at its source. Instead of ideologically synchronizing contradictions or assigning them to separate halls of the academy, Critical theory seeks to articulate them. The task is not to homogenize the insolubles, but as it were, to culture the differences. To culture the differences entails pursuing two different logics simultaneously, the logic of society and the logic of the psyche. As noted in the preface, the history of this effort has not been a happy one. Those seeking to work out the relationship between Marxism and psychoanalysis have not been immune to the intellectual division of labor that severs the life nerve of dialectical thought. The various efforts to interpret Marx and Freud have been plagued by reductionism. The inability to retain the tension between individual and society, psychology and political economy. Even Wilhelm Reich, the most dedicated of the Marx-Freud theoreticians, did not escape reductionism. What is necessary is the preservation without reification of this tension. Psychoanalysis and historical materialism must coexist. They are fractured pieces of a fractured society. The reduction of a social constellation to an individual and instinctual one is as inadmissible as the reverse. The obliteration of the individual in a supra-individual sociology more precisely, this supra-individual sociology is the reverse. Psychologism and sociologism are different sides of the coin of exchange value. The two logics, the logics of society and psyche, begin to intersect in the 1920s because the logic of Marxism itself was then in the process of being rethought and reformulated. The story of this rethinking of Marxism can only be suggested here. It was spurred by the collapse of the Marxist party and movement, especially German social democracy, in the years following World War I. Oh, the analysis of this collapse and failure was inseparable from an analysis and critique of the failure of Marxism itself. As crystallized in the works of George Lucas and Karl Korch, this critique suggested that the lethal de defect in the prevailing Marxism was its mechanical or automatic quality. It had conceived of social change as the changing of blueprints. Exactly what was lacking was the subjective, human, and philosophical content of Marxism. The efforts of Lucas and Korch, and after them others, such as the Frankfurt School, were towards salvaging this lost dimension of Marxism, subjectivity. The attempt of Marxists to think Freud has been defined by the continued failure of the European Revolution or the continued success of bourgeois society. The objective conditions for revolution seemed ripe long ago, 
for the revolutionary conditions have always been ripe. The weak link in Marxism was the iron link in bourgeois society, subjectivity. In the fateful months after November 1918, when the organized political power of the bourgeoisie was smashed, and outwardly there was nothing else in the way of the transition from capitalism to socialism, wrote Karl Korch about the brief revolutionary period in post-World War I Germany, the great chance was never seized because the socio-psychological preconditions for its seizure were lacking. It was these socio-psychological preconditions, the subjective moment, that became the focus for the left Freudians such as Reich. From the start, the pursuit of subjectivity within Western Marxism was couched in the negative. It was directed toward fathoming why subjectivity did not show, why the great chance was lost, and bourgeois society kept grinding on. It sought to explain, as it were, why there was no subjectivity and at the same time to awaken the subject to thought and action. To do this, necess necess to do this necessitated exploring the nature of the subject, not dismissing it, as doctrines of automatic mechanical social change did and do. Insofar as these doctrines are subjectless, they could not comprehend the dialectic of social change. Reich wrote in an autobiographical account of an abortive demonstration of some 200 communists in Vienna in 1928. These 200 communists believe that when industry objectively collapses, when wages are objectively reduced, and when the simplest freedom strivings are objectively repressed, that these things must automatically and self-evidently incite the people to revolutionary indignation. The whole of revolutionary politics in Germany and Austria until 1933 was built upon this idea. This thinking was wrong. As is well known to the Russian communist orthodoxy, the unofficial project of Western Marxism of revitalizing a lost moment of Marxism, subjectivity, and philosophy smacked of heresy. Those who were part of this effort, such as Lucas and Korch, were forced to submit or forced out. The Russian reaction to Freud and Freudians after an initial period was no more friendly. What is more, the conscientious defenders of Soviet Marxism discovered an internal relationship between the heretics, W. Jurinitz, and one of the first substantial Russian critiques of Freud in 1925, mentioned Lucas's errors and in the same breath denounced the Freudians for subjectivity. Jurinitz charged the Freudians with subjectivity, decadence, and aestheticism. He observed that the objective and intellectual style of the esthete was also noticeable in Lucas. All his other errors have their roots here. Jurinitz was on to something, yet the similarity of the efforts is as important as the distinction. If the similarity is derived from an exploration of subjectivity, the distinction is defined by two dimensions of subjectivity, the philosophical or historical and the psychological. Neither Lucas nor Korch studied this second dimension. The above citation from Korch on the absent socio-psychological preconditions for revolution is misleading. These preconditions are interpreted by Korch in non-psychological or only neo-psychological terms. According to him, what is lacking is the belief in the practicability of socialism. This in turn is derived from the backwardness of socialist theory vis-a-vis -vis all problems of the practical realization of socialism. Even within the heresy, Korch here remains orthodox in the allegiance to a non-psychological dimension of subjectivity. The psychic dimension is lost, or at least diluted in its translation into theoretical questions on the practical content of socialism. If Lucas grants the existence of a psychic dimension, it is only so as to, dis as to dismiss it. He strictly separates a philosophical form from a psychic dimension, giving a political reading of the psychic one as contingent and empirical, as such he considers it the source for revisionism and opportunism. To Lucas, psychological consciousness is an immediate and positivist one, a consciousness that remains within the grip of bourgeois society. It lacks theory.
Class consciousness is identical with neither the psychological consciousness of individual members of the proletariat, nor the mass psychological consciousness of the proletariat as a whole. But it is, on the contrary, the sense become conscious of the historical role of the class. It is exactly revisionism and opportunism that confuse the two. Opportunism mistakes the actual psychological state of consciousness of the proletariat for the class consciousness of the proletariat. It seeks to reduce class consciousness of the proletariat to the level of the psychologically given. To Marxist schooled in psychoanalysis, it is this very cleavage between the dimensions of history and psychology that seems questionable. It openly ignores any dialectic between a psychological and historical consciousness. If this is the heretical introduction of subjectivity into Marxism, it remains too traditional. Stripped of its psychic content, it is a paper-thin subjectivity. Lacking a psychic dimension, the subject turns abstract, distant from the actual carnal and psychic individual. To be sure, these formulations were also Lucas's strength. The deliberate repudiation of a non-historical psychological consciousness bearing the imprint of bourgeois society. But it was also his weakness. The non-dialectical flight from the empirical and psychological subject exhausted itself in bad abstractions. The abyss between the abstractions and the empirical reality could only be bridged by the party. Hence, it has recently been argued that Lucas's fetish of the party follows from his neglect of the psychological subjective moment. Critical theory does not know a sharp break between these two dimensions. They are neither rendered identical nor absolutely severed. In its pursuit of this dialectical relationship, it has resisted the two forms of positivism that lose the tension, psycho psychologism and sociologism. <laughs> if the specific tendency of bourgeois and liberal thought had been, has been towards psychologism, the reduction of social concepts to individual and psychological ones, the specific tendency of socialist and Marxist thought has been toward the opposite, the reduction of individual concepts to a desic desiccated notion of history and society. <clears throat> Both flatten out a society individual antagonism, the former in favor of an abstract notion of the individual, the latter of an ab abstract notion of society. To be sure, psychologism remains false in all its forms, while sociologism at least pays respect to society as the determining structure. In the face of the present impotence of the individual, all individuals, what is primary in explaining social processes and tendencies is society and sciences concerned with society, sociology and economics. Yet if sociologism does not err at first in underestimating the force and power of society, it errs at second. In sidestepping the psychic structure of the individual, it photographs without penetrating society. It does not peel away so as to reach society's deeper reign over the individual. It gets the picture but not the essence. A specific problem for Western Marxism in the perpetuation of an obsolete social system to be analyzed is why a revolutionary subject does not act or appear. Since the market economy was shattered and patched up provisionally until the next crisis, its laws do not suffice for its explanation, other than by psychology, in which the objective compulsion is continually and newly internalized. It is not understandable either why men passively adjust to a condition of unchanged destructive irrationality or why they enroll in movements whose contradiction to their own interests is in no way difficult to perceive. Sociologism underestimates the primacy of society by not exploring its depth relations with and over the individual. It banalizes society to a surface phenomenon. A, convergent, a convergence takes place between the liberal psychoanalytic revisions of the Neo-Freudians and the anti-psychoanalytic Marxism. Both suffer from sociologism, the former unwittingly and the latter knowingly. The, Ru the Russian orthodoxy exercised subjectivity. The psychoanalytic revisionists deliberately add it.
Both, however, lose it. Soviet Marxism dismissing subjectivity from the start ends with a contentless notion of society. The Neo-Freudians, in their eagerness to find the role of society, do not get past the surface and end with a vapid notion of society. Again, regardless of their own politics, it has been Freud and his followers who, in their stubborn pursuit of the genesis and structure of the individual psyche, have testified to the power of society in and over the individual. This is the authentic dialectic of psychoanalysis, apparently the opposite of the universal society. Psychoanalysis rediscovers society in the individual monad. The critical edge of psychoanalysis is rooted in this dialectic. It pierces the sham of the isolated individual with the secret of its socio-sexual biological substratum. Freudian psychology does not so much capitulate to the appearance of individuality as it fundamentally destroys it, as only a philosophical and social concept can do. Depth psychology, by its own logic, turns into sociology and history. Sociologism prematurely cuts off an exploration of subjectivity in the name of society, which it can no longer understand without subjectivity. Critical theory, drawing upon psychoanalysis, sinks into subjectivity till it hits bottom. Society. It is here where subjectivity devolves into objectivity. Subjectivity is pursued till it issues into the social and historical events that preformed and deform the subject. This constitutes the subject object, object dialectic, a dialectic which is a violation of the logic of positivism shared by both psychological behaviorists and their opponents, humanist psychologists. This positivist logic alternatively prescribes subjectivity as non-scientific or recommends it as non-scientific human value. Both variants of positiv positivism <laughs> accept the vacant notion of the subject, only they appraise it differently. Before the gaze of critical theory, the illusion that the subject is purely subjective becomes transparent. It sees through to the objective content of subjectivity. Subjectivity itself is to be brought to objectivity. Its movements are not to be banished from cognition. To bring subjectivity to objectivity entails teaching it how to speak about what it bespeaks. Society and history. Such an effort is an objective theory of subjectivity. An objective theory of subjectivity is twice objective. Not only does it explore subjectivity till it reveals its social and objective determinants, but it reveals a society that had administered the subject out of existence. Again, Marxism, at least since Lucas and Korch, explores subjectivity, but a revolutionary subject that does not appear. That does not appear. Hence, the theory of subjectivity is also a theory of bourgeois society that eradicated the subject. The individual is de-individualized, rendered subjectless. In bourgeois society, capital is independent and has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. A critical theory of subjectivity to be adequate to this reality is consciously contradictory. It pursues subjectivity till, so to speak, it disappears. Its psychoanalysis is negative, a theory of a subjectless subject, or a not yet liberated subjectivity. Such a theory is to be distinguished from positive psychologies, theories of ego formation, identity, growth, and so on, that assume what is yet to be created, the individual. Negative psychoanalysis is psychoanalysis in the era of synchronized capitalism. It is the theory of the individual in eclipse. It is psychoanalysis just to its own field of inquiry, the individual, in the period of the disintegration of the ego under the impact of a massified society. Negative psychoanalysis is twice objective in that it traces at first the objective content of subjectivity and second discovers there is only an objective configuration to subjectivity. Today there is no subjectivity. Here as elsewhere the way out is through the overpowering of the subject by the object, which hinders it from becoming a subject, hinders it just so from knowledge of the object. This overpowering by a brutal reality which has left the individual numb and dumb 
is to be overcome, at least in thought and theory, before subjectivity can be realized. Insight into the very material and social conditions that mutilate it. Before the individual can exist, before it can become an individual, it must recognize to what extent it does not yet exist. It must shed the illusion of the individual before becoming one. Subjectivity must be brought to objectivity so it can be realized. This is the nub of the matter. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flower from the chain, not so that man will wear the chain without any fantasy or consolation, but so that he will shake off the chain and cull the living flower. A further clarification. Smuggled into the term subjectivity as used in this chapter is a crucial ambiguity. It seems to refer at the same time to two very different phenomena, the proletariat as a potential subject of history and the bourgeois subject as the problematic individual tossed up by the market. This ambiguity is one of reality and is not merely conceptual. The very problem is defined by the fact that the specific qualities of the proletariat, which, to follow Lucas, steer it in the direction of class consciousness, are, temporarily, overlaid with specific bourgeois properties that dissolve class consciousness. The concepts do span the classes, but this is caused by the failure of the specific proletariat properties to emerge. The class with radical chains is also restrained by a bourgeois chain, that gives it freedom of movement without freedom. An example may sharpen this. At first, it may seem misleading to speak of the eclipse of the individual as if this were true of both the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, an eclipse of, subject, of subjectivity per se. Theoretically, in Marxism, the proletariat was never composed of bourgeois individuals. This was a luxury reserved for the wealthier. However, Again, the very problem is that the form of individuality that prevails in the bourgeoisie is not confined to the bourgeoisie. Rather, it seeps into the proletariat and cripples the process of the proletariat which seeks to constitute itself as the historical subject. Why this process occurs and how reversible or deeply embedded it is in the proletariat cannot be discussed here. Important only is that the concepts that seem to blur the distinction between classes are not to be explained away or denied by the mere affirmation that capitalism is a class society. This is true, but the concepts gain their truth from the dynamic of capitalism that within a class structure works to level. Concretely, this means that late capitalism tends to erase the specific and unique secondary qualities of the proletariat that seem to be the precondition for class consciousness. A proletariat that is partially composed of bourgeois individuals is undoubtedly a contradiction, but it is a contradiction of reality, not simply of concepts. Within the revolutionary theory as derived from Lucas, the political content of negative psychoanalysis is found. To the point that a subject does not develop, the revolutionary process is thrown into doubt, for the shift and reversal of bourgeois history does not take place. An automatic process that is a mechanical one without a subject can only update the existing society. To change directions necessitates a historical and conscious intervention. What does not derive from Lucas is an adequate exploration of the failure of the subject's intervention. This may in part stem from the other dimension of subjectivity, the psychological. Aside from the external social and material conditions, counter-revolution may be embedded in the revolutionaries themselves, a form of psychic reification. Marcuse has stated this most emphatically. Past revolutions seem to proceed to a certain point from which the transition to new, not only quantitatively, but qualitatively different conditions would perhaps proceed. At this point, the revolution is usually vanquished and domination is internalized re-established and continued at a higher level. Following Freud, we can raise the question whether alongside the socio-historical thermidor that can be demonstrated in all past revolutions, there is not also a psychic thermidor. Is there perhaps in the individuals themselves already a dynamic at work that internally negates possible liberation and gratification and that supports external forces of denial? Or as Marcuse put it elsewhere,
In every revolution, there seems to have been a historical moment when the struggle against domination might have been victorious. But the moment passed. An element of self-defeat seems to be involved in this dynamic, regardless of the validity of such reasons as the prematurity and inequality of forces. It should be noted to what extent the reformulations that sought to introduce into Marxism a psychological moment of subjectivity and implicitly or explicitly were critiques of a vulgar automatic Marxism were enunciated by Freud himself. Evidently, Freud was not arguing from a left position. If he could write that the Russian Revolution was a tremendous experiment, a message of a better future, he could also state, in spite of all my dissatisfaction with the present economic system, I have no hope that the road pursued by the Soviets will lead to improvement. Indeed, any such hope that I may have cherished has disappeared in this decade of Soviet rule. I remain a liberal of the old school. Yet his critique of communism has two par or had two parts. First, he denied that the destructive drive could be practically eradicated. The other objection, however, was directed against the narrow materialistic base of Marxism. To Freud, the superego was rooted in parents, earlier education, etc. It was a tool of the past anchored in the present. It seems likely that what are known as materialist views of history sin in underestimating this factor. They brush it aside with the remark that human ideologies are nothing other than the product and superstructure of their contemporary economic conditions. This is true, but very probably not the whole truth. Mankind never lives entirely in the present. The past lives on in the ideologies of the superego and yields only slowly to the influences of the present and to new changes. And so long as it operates through the superego, it plays a powerful part in human life, independently of economic conditions. The provocative extract of a 1937 letter that Jones published should be considered here. In it, Freud responds to a criticism of his comprehension of Marx. I know that my comments on Marxism are no evidence either of a thorough knowledge or of a correct understanding of the writings of Marx and Engels. I have since learned, rather to my satisfaction, that neither of them has denied the influence of ideas and superego factors. That invalidates the main contrast between Marxism and psychoanalysis, which I had believed to exist. Probably the first and most directly political effort to seek out the psychological grounds of self-defeat belongs to Paul Federn's work from 1919. Um, oh, forgive my pronunciation here. Zur Psychologie der Revolution, Die Vaterlos Gesellschaft, an interpretation of the contemporary German revolution. Federn, who was a student of Freud and a socialist, suggested that a deeply embedded patriarchal authoritarian attitude, which is encased even in socialist organizations, has kept bourgeois society on its tracks. The general father complex was responsible for the fact that the, that the social order has so long been able to maintain itself. If this complex is not dissolved, revolutionary progress is in doubt. It is very possible that despite the devastation by the war, the patriarchal order will be able to solve the technical problems of rebuilding a new economy if the psychic preconditions, the unconscious subsumption under the father-son relation, does not cease. What is unique in Federn's work is that he translated these formulations into the political reality. His work is a critique of social democracy as it perpetuates the father-son relation and further is a defense of councils which create a new ethos of brothers and sisters, and finally abolish the father-son society. All previous organizations were organized from the leader down. The organizational pyramid provided the father-son relation with an ideal form. The new organization, the council, grows out of the masses, out of the base, and from the base it receives the impulse and invisible psychic system, the relation of the brother. Yet Federn was a pessimistic Yet Federn was pessimistic about the possibility that the new ethos would be victorious. Too much of the old society worked against it. Like Reich after him, Federn stressed the importance of the family in implanting the patriarchal attitudes and the difficulty of extirpating them. The congruence of the family with the fallen patriarchal-based state of the Kaiser, 
and its incongruence with an organization of brothers is the only authentic psychological problem in the construction of a non-patriarchal order of society. The very depths of this anchoring left Federn in doubt as to whether a society of brothers can be yet achieved. He closed on a pessimistic note. The father-son complex has suffered the greatest defeat, yet from the family, education, and inherited feeling it is deeply rooted in mankind, and it probably this time also will prevent a complete victory of the fatherless society. Federn's analysis was not pursued, if only because the political situation would not again lend itself to a favorable psychoanalytic interpretation of a revolutionary upsurge. Rather, the accent fell on a psychological mechanism that sustained the ongoing capitalist system and blocked class consciousness and the historical subjectivity. As with Federn, a specific relationship was emphasized, the authoritarian one of father and son. With Reich from the Frankfurt School, this was generalized into the notion of character. For Marxists, character seemed to concretely express the mediation between the individual instincts and the social necessities. In Reich's and Fromm's work of the early 1930s, character is a pre uh, is a precipitation yeah, of the intersection of the individual psyche and society. A significant vehicle for imprinting character is the family. Psychoanalytic characterology, wrote Fromm in a 1932 essay, Psychoanalytic Characterology and its Relevance for Social Psychology first published in the Frankfurt School Journal, can serve as the starting point for a social psychology that will show how the character traits common to most members of a society are conditioned by the distinctive nature of that society. This social influence on character formation operates first and foremost through the family. Freud overlooked, Fromm wrote in the Frankfurt School collection, um, Autoritat and Family from 1936, that the family in the first place represents particular social content and through its mediation in the production of socially necessary mental structure lies its most important social function. Or as Reich wrote in Character Analysis in 1933, every social order creates those character forms which it needs for its preservation. In other words, the character structure is the crystallization of the sociological process of a given epoch. According to uh, Geschlechtsreif and Taltsemkeit E. Hemerol from 1930, the family is the specific instrument of education of bourgeois society. It is the mediator between the economic structure of bourgeois society and its ideological superstructure. The Frankfurt School followed the drift of this analysis to search out psychic mechanisms such as character structure, that thwarted class consciousness. Horkheimer wrote in 1932 that men preserve economic relations which they have outgrown in force and need, instead of replacing them through a higher and more rational form of organization, is possible only because the actions of a numerically significant social stratum are not determined by cognition, but by an instinctual motive force that falsifies consciousness. In no way do mere ideological maneuvers form the root of this historically important moment. On the contrary, the psychic structure of these groups, that is the character of their members, is constantly renewed in connection with their role in the economic process. Or as Horkheimer put it later, force in its naked form is in no way sufficient to explain why a dominated class so long endures the yoke. It is especially insufficient in periods when the economic apparatus is ripe for a better system of production. The culture is in dissolution, and the property relations and existing forms of life in general overtly become a fetter to social forces. To understand this one, to understand this, one need know the psychic composition of men in various social groups. The family is again crucial. The family as one of the most important agents of education concerns itself with the reproduction of human character and largely imparts to human characters the authoritarian attitudes on which the bourgeois order depends. The notion of character was carried through to later Frankfurt School works, most notably the more academic, the authoritarian personality. 
If the questions posed differed from the earlier ones, both the answers settled on character structure and the family as instruments of social mediation, one in the context of a delayed revolution, the other in the context of potential fascism. However, in the authoritarian personality, the sociological and political elements seemed to be hidden. The danger of psychologism loomed. Adorno, in his scientific autobiography, noted a misconception about the authoritarian personality which, because of its emphasis, was not entirely unjustified, that the authors had sought to analyze anti-Semitism together with fascism solely subjectively and had fallen into the, into the error that political economic phenomena were primarily psychological. But, responded Adorno, in contradiction to certain economic orthodoxy, they had not been inflexible toward psychology, but sought it as a moment of enlightenment. Yet we have never doubted the primacy of objective factors over psychological. We saw socio-psychology as a subjective mediation of an objective social system. Without its mechanism, the subject would not be able to be held on the leash. The notion of character as a necessary form of dehumanization distinguishes the Frankfurt School notion from that employed by the Neo-Freudians and others. With the Frankfurt School, character participates in the dialectic of second nature. It is historical as the product of a specific society, and it is natural as an unconscious phenomenon which inexorably follows laws and patterns. Character, like personality, is a form of unfreedom. Against the Neo-Freudians who consider character a harmonious totality, Adorno interprets it as a result of a series of shocks inflicted on the individual. It bespeaks oppression and violence, not growth, choice, and values. The character which they, the revisionists, hypostasize is to a much greater extent the result of such shocks. The totality of the character is false. One could almost call it a system of scars, which are only integrated and never entirely under suffering, or character is the result of the reification of real experience. Character is another form of the suppression and molding of the autonomous individual in bourgeois society. It refers to the same process that renders narcissism the prevailing form of individualism. The ego regresses into unconsciousness. It becomes automatic. The ego's reactions to the outside world and to the instinctual desires emerging from the id, writes Marcuse, becomes increasingly automatic. The conscious processes of confrontation are replaced to an increasingly large degree by immediate, almost physical reactions. It is as though the free space which the individual has at his, at his disposal for his psychic process has been greatly narrowed down. It is no longer possible for something like an individual psyche to develop. This reduction of the relatively autonomous ego is empirically observable in people's frozen gestures. This whole process Marcuse calls the reification and autom automatization of the ego. For Orthodox and Russian Marxists, a suspicion was raised by these formulations. The suspicion of subjectivity or psychologism, the reduction of social analysis to individual analysis, revolution to therapy. Crude mechanical Marxism found no place for the subject. It patterned social change on a quasi-automatic process. This was the inner relationship between the German social democracy and the Stalinist orthodoxy, and this is why both resisted the reinterpretation of Marxism centered around Lucas and Korch that sought to save a philosophical subjective dimension. The introduction of a psychic dimension of subjectivity seemed to suggest that the ills of society could be cured by curing the ills of the individual. The suspicion was not entirely unfounded. The critique of Jernitz that found a relationship between Lucas and the Freudians was inspired by a book by Aurel Colney, Psychoanalysis and Society that reveled in psychologisms. Anarchism is the faithful social projection of the, of the uterus. Bolshevism is characterized by the withdrawal of inhibitions and repressions. Moreover, psychologism surfaced continually within psychoanalysis. Fritz Wittels presented to the Vienna Society a psychological analysis of a Russian revolutionary who had recently attempted a political assassination. 
absolutely no credence was given to a political context or motivation. Adler, then a social democrat, protested. One cannot follow Whittles in his opinion that in a real event, the ideology can be totally divorced from what we call emotional life. Even Freud agreed with Adler. One must not condemn the assassins so harshly and unmask them because of unconscious motives. The unconscious motive deserves forbearance. The Marxists who were drawn to psychoanalysis were forced to carefully work out their theoretical positions so as to avoid the specific failing of psychoanalysis, psychologism. Their formulations, while remaining alert to the charge of subjectivism, implicitly or explicitly criticized a vulgar Marxism that ignored the individual and subject. Probably the most successful formulations belong to those of Reich and Otto Fenichel, but they were hardly alone. The efforts not only in Germany but elsewhere are numerous. Reichs are outstanding if only because he was the most active and prolific. Reich worked to to delineate the exact place of psychoanalysis within Marxism. In the terms used here, he explored the relationship between a psychic dimension of subjectivity and a historical one. How the former blocked the latter, ultimately the proletariat itself, from acting within the historical reality. At least in the beginning, he was very much alive to the dangers of psychologism. His 1929 essay, Dialectical Materialism and Psychoanalysis, in part a reply to Jurnitz's piece, stated that psychoanalysis possessed limited validity. Validity. It was restricted to the psychological life of man in society. It cannot replace a sociological doctrine, nor can a sociological doctrine develop out of it. For this reason, the phenomenon of class consciousness is not accessible to psychoanalysis, according to uh, this, to Reich. The bulk of the essay was a critique of a vulgar materialism that maintained that psychological phenomena do not exist. The life of the soul is simply a physical process. Citing Marx's thesis on Feuerbach that all previous materialism was defective in ignoring subjectivity or activity, Reich showed the incompatibility of simple materialism with Marxism. If the crude Marxists were logical, one should not speak of class consciousness but should wait until chemistry has supplied the necessary formula for the physical processes concerned, or until the science of reflexes has discovered the appropriate reflexes. Rather, within Marxism, there was no one-to-one -one relation, no automatic chemical or mechanical cause and effect between the economic reality and the consciousness of the subjects. Exactly here is where psych psychoanalysis intervenes. Between the two terminal points, the economic structure of society at one end, the ideological superstructure at the other, psychoanalysis sees a number of intermediate stages, and exactly here it can play a role within Marxism, at that point where psychological questions arise as a result of the Marxist thesis that materialist existence transforms itself into ideas inside the head, or psychoanalysis can clarify the way that ideologies are formed in inside the head. Other left Freudians of the period more or less followed Reich's formulations. Fromm wrote in Politik and Psycho... Psycho... Anal, psycho... Fuck. Politics and Psychoanalysis? The title's in German. So, Politik and Psychoanal Psychoanalysts. Uh, so Fromm wrote that psychoanalysis can show in what manner particular economic conditions influence the psychic apparatus of men and produce particular ideological results. It can provide information on the how of the dependence of ideological facts on particular configurations. Or as, Fra or as Fromm wrote in an essay for the Frankfurt School Journal, historical materialism could do without psychology, only where ideology was the immediate expression of economic interests. Otherwise, psychoanalysis can illuminate how the economic situation is transformed into ideology via man's drives. Similarly, Otto Fenichel would write in an article for Reich's journal, the economic conditions do not just influence the individual directly, but also indirectly via a change in his psychic structure.
Again, psychoanalysis intervenes at the actual how of this transformation, the transformation of the ideology into a force in the individual. Neither the full content of Reich's work nor the stages of his development can be discussed here. The emphasis of his work shifted from the 1929 essay. It sought to uncover the concrete mediation by which ideology was materialized and anchored in the individual. This became urgent with the political events. The question posed was why the proletariat fell short of its revolutionary mission, or alternatively, why it was susceptible to fascism. The family and character structure moved to the center of the analyses. In the context here, perhaps Wright's most important contribution, following the outlines of the theory of psychoanalysis and Marxism, was the notion of reproduction. Production referred to the cultural and ideological necessities that are concretely produced by this society, but hang, so to speak, in the air. Reproduction refers to the manner and mode by which ideology is translated in the everyday life and behavior of the individual. As Reich described it, the ideology and repressive morality which are at first derived from the property relations ultimately result in the inner acceptance of the morality by the mass individual. This in turn becomes a social and reactionary force, psychically reproduced ideology. This social morality anchored in all individuals and reproducing itself permanently has in this manner a reciprocal effect on the economic base in a conservative direction. The exploited person affirms the economic order which guarantees his exploitation. The sexually repressed person affirms even the sexual order which restricts his gratification and makes him ill, and he wards off any system that might correspond to his need. In this manner, morality carries out its socio-economic assignment. The full extent of Reich's critique of crude Marxism is best found in the mass psychology of fascism. It shows in microcosm the divergence between a dialectical Marxism and a mechanical one that eliminated subjectivity, admitting only automatic progress in history. His first words, the German working class has suffered a serious defeat, apparently earned him the wrath of the party regu regulars. They were a denial of the revolutionary perspective and recalled Trotskyist tendencies. And in Nackwert, in a Nackwert from 1934 to the second edition, where he noted that the official communist position is that the world is in the midst of a revolutionary upsurge, Reich attacks as the most dangerous fetter to German socialism, the unshakable belief in the, in the natural necessity of socialist victory. The Social Democrats, crude Marxists, and others have been unable to conceive the mediation of the subjective and objective. The naive Marxists think that they can ignore men entirely, and with a change in the economic structure, the transformation of man will follow almost automatically. To Reich, it is necessary to recognize the cleavage between the economic structure and the consciousness of the proletariat. The usual communist replies to Reich were not much above slander and slogans. One of the better ones was by I. Sapir in response to Reich's first essay, Psychoanalysis and Dialectical Materialism. Sapir did indicate one difficulty in Reich's position. Reich claimed that the question of class consciousness was inaccessible to psychoanalysis. Yet he was theorizing about the problem of ideology formation, that is, the falsification of class consciousness. How could one separate the question of class consciousness from that of ideology? In a response to this, Reich reformulated the relationship between psychoanalysis and Marxism. He wrote that the blocks to class consciousness were accessible to psychoanalysis. The more rational the behavior that is the more in tune with class consciousness, the less the need for psychological interpretations. A more important reply to Reich is to be found in Siegfried Bernfeld's response to Reich's critique of the death instinct. According to Reich, this reply was officially approved by Freud himself. At first, Freud wanted Reich's essay to be published with an introductory note stating that it was written by a dedicated communist. But because of opposition to this unprecedented editorial action in a psychoanalytic journal, Freud settled for a reply by Bernfeld, which was published with Reich's essay. Bernfeld noted two things in passing that could suggest future differences between Reich and a critical psychology.
Reich's one, narrow materialism, and two, positive notion of health. According to Bernfeld, Reich wanted to purge psychoanalysis of metaphysical hypotheses and restrict it to the clinical and the narrowest sense of the word. Further, Reich pursued a vague ideal of sexual health, full genitality, orgiastic pot potency, etc. If this was true in 1933, it was truer later. The attempt to remain loyal to a dialectical Marxism, shunning psychologism and sociologism, faltered. It was too great an effort. Reich began to succumb to the reification he sought to undo. He always stressed that psychoanalysis was a natural science, and tended to define sexuality and health in terms of physiology. The positive description of the genital character in character analysis threatened to dissolve the social critique. It was as if there could be healthy sexuality without a social transformation. These tendencies surfaced clearly and openly in an essay from 1935 on sexual economy. In this, Reich claimed that his sexual economy is not the product of the addition of Marxism and psychoanalysis. Rather, the kernel of sex economy theory around which all further perceptions group is my orgasm theory. This field of facts exists neither within the scope of Marx's economic teachings nor in analytic psychology, but rather concerns biological, physiological phenomena which exist in all things that live. The social critique narrows capitalism sorry, the social critique narrows. Capitalism destroys orgastic potency, and this Reich defined in purely mech mechanical terms. A functional relation to mechanical tension, electric charge, electric discharge, and mechanical relaxation. The completion of this series and its undisturbed function is the surest sign of a healthy psychic apparatus. It should be noted that it was exactly on this score that critical theory, starting with Freud, dissociated itself from Reich. Freud, as early as 1928, in a letter to Lou Andreas Salome, attacked Reich's fetish of genital sexuality. Freud called Reich a worthy but impetuous young man, passionately devoted to his hobby horse, who now salutes in the genital orgasm the antidote to every neurosis. Fromm, some years later in the Frankfurt School Journal, criticized Reich's romanticizing of primitive sexuality. Horkheimer would do the same, commenting on the utopian meaning which Reich ascribed to the release of genital sexuality. Marcuse's remarks on Reich have followed these earlier ones. Reductionism of the psychological or sociological variety haunted psychoanalysis. Reich himself did not escape one form, nor the neo-Freudians another. Critical theory avoids the banalization of psychoanalysis by neither distending it to include all of society nor confining it to therapy and sexuality of the individual. Rather, it has worked to preserve psychoanalysis as a critique in tension, a critique that transcends the individual but does not forget the individual in some supra-historical -histor psychological drama. Consciousness is not to be psychologized away as a waste product of individual neuroses or instincts, nor sociologized away as the prevailing social norms and values. Otto Fenichel, once close to Reich and later to the Frankfurt School, sought to preserve both individual instinctual and social opponents or components without reducing one to the other. His work illustrates critical theories' loyalty to the tension within psychoanalysis. It has received little attention outside psychoanalytic circles, despite its sustained effort to resist reification and simplification. Against interpretations that conceived of capitalism as derived from individual instincts, Fenichel stressed its social and extra-individual factors. Against analyses that abstracted capitalism from the instinctual dynamic, Fenichel recalled its instinctual roots. Sander Ferenczi, in the ontogenesis of the interest in money, traced the capitalist fascination with money to the child's interest in feces. Pleasure in the intestinal contents becomes enjoyment of money, which, however, is seen to be nothing other than odorless, dehydrated filth that has been made to shine. Fenichel, in a response to Ferenczi, 
as well as to Geza Roheim and others prone to psychologism, argued in the drive to amass wealth in 1938 for a reciprocal action between instincts and the social configuration. The instincts represent the general tendency, while matters of money and the desire to become wealthy represent a specific form uh, which the general tendency can assume only in the presence of certain definite social conditions. The existence of the erogenous pleasure in collection causes Ferenczi to overlook the fact that when the capitalist strives to increase his capital, he does this on very rational grounds. He is forced to it by competitors who produce on a larger scale. A social system of this kind makes use of and strengthens erogenous drives that serve the necessity for accumulating. Of this, there can be no doubt. There is considerable doubt, however, as to whether the existing economic conditions of production were created by the biological instinct. He wrote in conclusion, such a drive to become wealthy at one time did not exist, and at some future time will exist no longer. Fenical equally resisted the errors of Adlerians, Neo-Freudians, and others who abstracted society from its biological and instinctual substrata and thereby attained a sham socialization of psychoanalysis. In a review essay of Fromm's Escape from Freedom, Fenical observed that the dynamic of instincts and society is lost, and the social moment that is advanced is idealized and spiritualized. Instead of studying the interrelations of erogenous zones and object relationships, they, Fromm and Cardiner, think statically and are of the opinion that the insight into the role of object relationships contradicts the importance of erogenous zones. The irony of the endeavor to escape from Freud's biologism is that it issues into real biologism, an abstract and content contentless idealism, which is ahistorical and invariant biology. Fromm gives examples of drives which came into existence at certain points of the historical development and thinks that this is an argument against Freud the drive to enjoy nature's beauty, and the drive to work. Certainly nobody will deny the social origin of these drives, but their social origin does not contradict the assumption that deeper biological needs have been transformed into these new drives. Further, these drives become very abstract, and in comparison with Freud's concrete analysis of the instinctual attitude, extremely vague. The materialist advantage of psychoanalysis is that it has shown that ideals such as truth and justice are not, what Fromm considers them, genuine strivings, but are formed out of biological needs by socially determined experiences. It is not to be understood why an idealistic tendency to grow and develop should be regarded, as Fromm regards it, as biologically inherent in human nature, and sexual partial instincts should not. Fenical wrote elsewhere in a review of a book by another Neo-Freudian, Karen Horney. Dr. Horney writes, My conviction expressed in a nutshell is that psychoanalysis should outgrow the limitations set by its being an in instinctivistic, instinctivistic and genetic psychology. My conviction expressed in a nutshell is that the value of psychoanalysis as a natural scientific psychology is rooted in its being an intrin in uh, instinctivistic and a genetic psychology. Fenical's defense of psychoanalysis as a genetic science, that is one focused on genesis and origins, can be pursued for a moment in a philosophical and theoretical dimension. This dimension can illuminate the nature of psychological and sociological reductionism, and it can cast light on the problem of consciousness as a psychic and or historical phenomenon. These dimensions are interrelated. The concept of the ego is dialectical, wrote Adorno, both psychic and extra-psychic, a quantum of libido and the representative of outside reality. He also stated, the bourgeoisie in its late phase is incapable of thinking genesis and validity in their simultaneous unity and difference. These two statements are of one piece. They refer to different forms of positivist logic that can only flit between thinking exclusively about origins psychologism or exclusively about an abstract notion of truth 
and ideas. Both are forms of reductionism, unable to preserve the dialectic of individual and society. Oh fuck, I lost my spot. Both are forms of reductionism, unable to preserve the dialectic of individual and society. One reduces all to the roots e.g. capitalism to an instinct, and denies any truth that claims to go beyond its origin. Such teachings are to be found within psychoanalysis as well as elsewhere, as in varieties of sociology of knowledge. The equally blank approach disregards origins and accepts at face value claims to truth. This tilts over into pure idealism, as it refuses to acknowledge or study the contradiction between the historical substratum and the extra-historical claims. Again, what is at issue is the nature of class consciousness and, in particular, the very relationship that most Marxists have ignored, the relationship between a psychological and historical dimension. If one defines consciousness exclusively by its subjective and psychological origin, then no particular form has any more claimed truth than any other. One has a model of society, of self-interest groups, all with equal demands, equally right and equally wrong. If consciousness is abstracted from its origin in reality, one is left with an idealistic notion of the battle of ideas uprooted from a carnal and psychic reality. Adorno eschews both approaches. In his book on Husserl, he wrote, the error of logical psychologism is that it wished to derive immediately out of psychic facts the validity of logical statements. Yet Husserl was equally wrong in his critique of logical psychologism. If he is right, if he is right in disputing the immediate identity of Genesis and validity, he is wrong in hypothesizing their difference. In his lectures on the theory of knowledge, Adorno noted that in response to psychologism, Recent philosophy has relapsed into a form of platonic realism. The precept that the validity of the laws of thought is simply independent of the emergence of the ego is as false as the reverse pre precept. That the laws of thought and laws of Genesis are simply identical. Or as he wrote elsewhere, Genesis and validity are not to be separated without contradiction. Objective truth preserves the moment of its origin. The latter works permanently within it. Consciousness and thought are neither to be reduced to their subjective origin nor totally abstracted from it. The Neo-Freudians, as some left Freudians, were unable to maintain this dialectic. Psychoanalysis itself was diluted, watered down into either a psychological technique for individual adjustment or a superficial theory of society. Both forms sustain each other. For psychoanalysis to be billed as an individual therapy promising health and adjustment, the critical and social components of the theory must be junked, since they plumb a social universe that precludes individual therapeutic claims to health. The preservation of such content, the meta theory of Freud, belong to the very marrow of critical theories reading of psychoanalysis. Its preservation nourished the resistance two subjective notions of subjectivity, conformist in their capitulation to the immediacy of the subject's own perceptions. Objective truth is the philosophical core of Freudianism. Freud once affirmed the great ethical element in psychoanalytic work is truth and again truth. He stated else elsewhere, psychoanalysis demands a degree of honesty which is unusual and even impossible in, in bourgeois society. This meta-theory, psychoanalysis as an objective science of subjectivity, passes on to Marxism. Negative psychoanalysis is psychoanalysis refracted through Marxism. This refraction calls for an examination of the individual, the object of psychoanalysis, in the light of developments since Freud's formulations. In brief, the transition to monopoly capital has dealt a mortal blow to the individual whose health was always ideology. The category of the individual, wrote Horkheimer, has not been able to withstand giant industry. Psychoanalysis turns negative, a study of remnants, 
It explores a subject whose subjectivity is being administered out of existence. The intent is to abet cracking the continuum of history. It pursues in the psychic dimension what Western Marxism has pursued in the non-psychological dimension. The objective force of capitalist domination that has paralyzed the subject as an active historical force. The exact relationship between these two spheres is difficult to define. Negative psychoanalysis knows only a negative relationship. It examines the psychic forms that have diverted, impeded, or dissolved a historical and class consciousness. It is tempting and even partly correct to draw exact parallels between these two dimensions, to transpose an analysis of reification as a form of consciousness to a psychic dimension, e.g. to find in the latter a frozen, rigid, non-dynamic quality associated with the far former. Marcuse himself speaks of the reification of the ego and studies of the authoritarian personality seem to have confirmed Sorry. Marcuse himself speaks of the reification of the ego and studies of the authoritarian personality seem to have confirmed its existence. Yet the non-identity between these two dimensions must not be forgotten, especially given recent developments. The psychic and character forms of reification are historically specific in a manner different from the non-psychic. Each has a different dynamic which is not insular but derived from the dynamic of capitalism. The concept of reification, as Adorno points out, must not be reified. It would be wrong to identify the sexually repressed, cold Puritan as the unchanging bourgeois character form of reification. Since Max Weber, the spirit of capitalism, but not capitalism itself, has been redone. Today, it is often the reverse. Instant intimacy, smiles, liberation in one's own backyard. Marcuse's concept of repressive desublimation or Adorno's of desexualization of sexuality are efforts to come to grips with the recent historical dynamic of the psychic dimension. This psychic dimension is as fluid and historically variable as capital itself. As the sec as the secession as the succession of capitalist forms accelerates so do the psychic forms in the blur the dead shells of domination appear to come alive even the most resilient are turned into desperados hunting for pleasures in the amusement park of life if critical theory is negative psychoanalysis is not to succumb to the lure of chase nor flee into old slogans it must plumb the psychic depths for sounds of sadness and revolt.